Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today at this River Restoration Northwest uh, conference session. Sneha, Rao, and I are very excited to talk to you about the monitoring that we're doing out at Staggerwald. So first off, I just want to talk a little bit about the background of Staggerwald as a restoration project. And that's really for the benefit of folks who might be viewing this video outside of the session com uh, context. Um, Staggerwald is a really large restoration project. It's part of the National Wildlife Refuge, the Staggerwald National Wildlife Refuge. It's over a thousand acres of historic Columbia floodplain habitat. And for restoration actions, some of the major actions that have happened on the site and are still happening are the removal of the elevated uh, channel that essentially pipelined Gibbons Creek from um, SR-14, the road connection, all the way to the Columbia did not provide a very good habitat for salmonids in that uh, stretch of the channel. That has now been removed the, and the, excuse me, the Gibbons Creek has been reintroduced to the alluvial fan and that hyperreic flow and then meandered and connected more naturally with the Columbia River. An additional 2.2, miles of levee have been removed from the site um, to increase natural connection between the wetland complex and the Columbia, especially during high flow events. And there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of restoration actions happening at uh, Staggerwald, but that just sort of uh, touches it a little bit to get an idea of what we're talking about when we're talking about monitoring today. So primarily I would like to showcase that we have a very collaborative monitoring plan that we've developed over multiple years. And this is in collaboration with many different partners, just like Staggerwald is an extremely collaborative restoration project, so was the monitoring plan. And it was started well into the design phase. So we were, it was before restoration happened, we were still designing the project and we started thinking about monitoring. And I think it's a unique approach and it's honestly saved us some time and energy moving forward in terms of thinking about what we're monitoring. Now, this monitoring plan is available for anyone who would like to read it. It's a living document. We will be updating it every year as things move forward. And you should be aware that in the plan, we've both listed things that are funded and are not currently funded with the idea that if funding does become available, we could quickly activate those sections of the plan. And those are very well laid out and you can understand what's going on. We have basic habitat conditions monitoring funding from BPA. So most of the monitoring that's happened is funded happening is funded through that program. If you want to know more about that program, I've provided a link here. Um, and then the plan also includes an adaptive management trigger table that provides a little bit more context so that when we're looking at our monitoring outcomes, we can identify if we need to approach some adaptive management actions or maybe we're doing a really good job. They're falling right within the thresholds that we're anticipating. So that's just a little bit of information about the plan. Um, we are going to try to provide a brief overview of some of the highlights. If you want more information, please go to that document link or feel free to reach out to us. Now, first of all, this is about innovative approaches to monitoring, cost savings, things like that. And in, in addition to really highlighting the work that we're doing at Staggerwald. And so when we're talking about that, I really want to highlight that planning and getting ahead of monitoring is going to save you time and money moving forward. A lot of folks say, we don't have a budget to monitor. We don't have time to monitor. Well, you're probably doing a lot of monitoring in the design phase of your project, just like we did at Staggerwald. And so if you can think about incorporating that pre-project monitoring into a monitoring plan, you could probably do some very, very targeted monitoring to answer some very targeted questions and maybe evaluate some hypotheses. So I think that some things I want to highlight about the plan and about what I would really hope other folks will start doing is not just having defined restoration goals, actions, and outcomes, which everybody does when they're planning a project, but taking those, create salmon habitat, improve conditions out of that context and into a measurable metric. And that takes a minute to do and maybe some collaboration, but if you can hone it down and think, okay, well, if we can collect water surface elevation and temperature, we might be able to evaluate X, Y, and Z about our project. That's really gonna help you down the line to have very targeted monitoring. And so you're not just collecting data to collect data, but you're collecting data to answer questions. And speaking of data, I think it's very critical that folks have a data management plan. 
a lot of times when we collect data multiple years and it's continuous water service elevation data, or maybe it's drone data, um, you can have a massive amount of data accumulate and it's going to quickly outpace Excel. And so thinking about how you want to manage that data long term on the front end of a project is going to be really helpful. And so right now, the Estuary Partnership is actually moving towards managing our data in a Tableau database, which allows us to share the data as well as analyze it. But you can manage the data in an access database or an R. Just having that idea going forward is going to be really helpful and save time and money. So getting back to the Staggerwall plan, as it stands, I think it's really important to think about your monitoring objectives. And so we're going to walk through our monitoring and objectives fairly quickly, but then spend a little bit of time on the drone monitoring and talk a little bit about our fish um, monitoring as well um, to kind of highlight those innovative approaches. So we have um, five different targeted objectives for monitoring, and they're kind of easily grouped into to topographic, kind of dirt moving, hydrologic changes, so physical conditions in the wetland, physical conditions in the alluvial fan and Gibbons Creek, and then thinking about the plant communities, thinking about the wetland complex shifting in plant community composition based on hydrology changes, also thinking about the survival monitoring um, of these plants that we've put in the ground and how those are doing over time. And then, of course, last but not least, thinking about the fish community and the macroinvertebrate community and how they develop post restoration. So for our hypotheses development, we are really framing our work on a comparing to reference site situation. So we have three reference sites. We have Campbell Slough, which also has a pit tag array or should have a pit tag array at the same time as Staggerwald. And it has had a lot of data collected historically through the ecosystem monitoring program. So we have a large data set to pull from when thinking about creating thresholds and monitoring to compare to. That is the same for Franz Lake in terms of a long history of monitoring. And for Reed Island, we are also selecting that site, although it's not an ecosystem monitoring site. So the ecosystem monitoring sites have a long time frame of, of data collection that is available for anyone to use. Uh, Reed Island is a very adjacent site, so that picks up on those Columbia River dynamics locally. And so these sites are used to frame all of the different monitoring metrics I talked about today in comparing restoration outcomes at Staggerwald Post. So for Staggerwald, we are laying out traditional transects across the different elevation gradients, these created wetland areas, some areas that have, were there historically and not graded. And so we can compare those different areas across the site and how they're looking um, both for the soil dynamics, sediment accretion and erosion. We're also looking at, um, of course, water surface elevation and temperature. Some of these metrics are contacted, are being collected continuously, con excuse me, continuously, while others are connected collected annually or seasonally, such as sediment accretion and photo points, channel cross sections. And then years pre one, three and five post, we'll be collecting uh, the very critical soil data, looking at how the soil is changing post restoration and then the topographic surveys. For wetland plant communities, we are collecting about 180 different one meter vegetation quadrats along those transects. Those are co-located with the soil data. These data will help us evaluate how those plant communities are changing over time. By nesting that information with those physical parameters, we can develop an understanding of the mechanisms of change. The hydrology is changing. The soil conditions are changing, likely because the hydrology is changing. That is driving potentially shifts in plant community composition and shifts in survival of our plantings. So those information are so critical to nest and understand these different objectives using the same sets of data. And so we think that, you know, this monitoring plan is very robust, but is actually made much more robust by the addition of both design data models that we created during design and then being able to incorporate those data with our UAV monitoring or the drone monitoring. And so we plan on leveraging um, the design modeling that we did using a hydrologic model paired with an ecosystem function model. We were able to establish what plant communities we thought would we'd see post restoration across the site. We use this information to plan for both designing the monitoring, designing the floodplain restoration approach, so scrape downs and plantings, and um, we will be able to use that to evaluate these hypotheses moving forward with our UAV data. 
So on that note, I'm going to pass the camera over to Sneha. Thanks, Sarah. And uh, I hope you don't mind uh, controlling the presentation and you know moving the slides forward. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sneha, and I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about the different tools and techniques and uh, the workflows that we've developed um, in order for us to validate the FM model and um, achieve our monitoring objectives that Sarah just spoke to you a little bit about. Now, even though we have such a comprehensive monitoring plan, the traditional approaches are going to allow us to quantify the vegetative and uh, topographic changes only within less than 1% of the project site. And uh, since Tiger World is such a large site, we try to incorporate UAVs or drones into our traditional um, into our traditional monitoring approaches so that we can collect a real representative data set of the project site. Um, we've been collecting uh, UAV data from the summer of 2019. And uh, over the past couple of years, we've seen the sites, we've seen the site change because of construction um, in terms of topography as well as terrain. And moving forward, it's going to present challenges in terms of accessibility. So for sites like this, having a UAV in combination with traditional approaches is quickly going to become quite a critical tool in habitat monitoring. At uh, Steigerwald, we are using drones to monitor the development of the Gibbons Creek alluvial fan. Uh, we are overseeing the channel developments, as well as uh, we are collecting multispectral imagery to aid in wetland community mapping. Um, next slide, Sarah. Um, I'm going to show you a map of some of the metadata that we collect to aid in our uh, multispectral image collection. Uh, these are basically known points of elevation called ground control points. Uh, as you can see on this map, these are the locations where these data sets are collected. And along with these ground control points, we also collect veg species and percent cover at these locations. Next slide. Now, once we've collected all of this information, um, we have a total of 4,000 RGB images and 8,000 NIR images. And we've collected this using a fairly basic drone. Um, we've used a Phantom 4 drone and we've retrofitted it with an NIR sensor. Um, all of this information is then processed in PIX4D, which is again a fairly common uh, photogrammetry software to, to obtain a um, few products called um, an orthorectified mosaic, which is an aerial view of the entire project site. We've collected digital surface models and digital elevation models, as well as uh, we've been able to get an NDVI raster, which is basically a vegetation index that is uh, formulated using the NIR images. Um, next slide. Out of all of these products, the, the most powerful of them is the high resolution digital terrain model that we've, been, that we've developed. Um, this is an example of one of the other large project sites that we've restored and we continue to monitor. Um, this is Waluski present at uh, Young's Bay in Astoria, and this is another 200 acre project site. We collected UAV data in 2010 during pre-restoration, and we went back in 2020 to collect post-restoration data. And uh, after the processing in PIX4D, we were able to get two digital terrain models which can clearly show the development of channels, uh, the topographic changes, as well as the wetland communities that have developed on site. Next slide. Now, once we've gotten all of these huge data sets. What we've done is we taken this in ArcGIS, post-processes, sorry, post-processed it um, to receive one giant data set. Uh, for Waluski itself, we got a data set that had 40 million data points. This is obviously too large to process in Excel, so we used um, the Tableau software to pull in 
all of the drone data and we um, com combined it with the the wet survey data, the RTK elevation data, the site hydrology data, and we were able to visualize different plant communities and different elevations at which they which they exist at the site. Uh, moreover, from the drone data that we collected, we were able to classify and map where these um, native and non-native communities existed at the site, as well as where we could find water and different channels. Um, next slide. Now, while we are able to collect high, highly technical data using these UAVs, which allow us to um, achieve our monitoring objectives, we also use our drones to collect photo points around the site. Um, since Tigerwald is another huge site and we've made a lot of modifications to the, to the terrain, uh, we anticipate that moving forward, only having in-ground photo points will not be the best way to show the changes that are occurring, these dynamic changes. So we established a network of 36 aerial photo points around the site. And I want to show you just a quick example of what this looks like. Um, next slide. So the example that I'm showing today will be the removal of um, the elevated channel. As you can see, in spring of 2020, uh, there's the levee and the elevated channel through which Gibbons Creek is flowing uh, in spring of 2021 around the dewatering of the site. And then in fall of 2021, how the site looks after the channel has been removed and uh, Gibbons Creek has been restored with historic flow. Um, as you can see, this sort of point of view you cannot receive by just having in-ground photo points. Um, we, can, we can show different types of topographic changes using UAVs, and this is one of the most powerful tools that help us in, in basically tracking how the site is, um, is doing just through normal photo points. Next slide. Now that we've spoken about um, UAVs and their strength in um, monitoring physical conditions as well as uh, wetland plant communities, one of the main objectives of this restoration project is also to increase so juvenile salmon habitat. And uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we're going to establish that. Uh, next slide. At Steigerwald, we are planning to install a new sort of pit array system, uh, which will provide us continuous uh, detection data. And we plan on collecting Newston toes uh, for pre-construction, as well as years one, three, and five years post. At uh, five year post restoration check-in, we are also planning on collecting fish data uh, in collaboration with, uh, with NOAA. Next slide, please. Um, in Steigerwald, one of the other new technologies that we're going to be adding is a new sort of pit array system called the pass-through pit array system. Um, this is quite superior in terms of technology to the traditional flat plate system. Uh, we'll be installing this in the main channel of uh, Gibbons Creek, between Gibbons Creek and Columbia River. And the reason we call this superior is because this is basically a system of cables, and which means that since it's going to be running the entire length, length of the, sorry, the width of the channel, we'll be able to receive a larger read area. Um, these cables are flexible and can be installed to match the bottom contour of the channel. So it won't be, um, it'll, it'll be less prone to like, damages during high flow events, and it's a lot easier to repair than the traditional systems. Uh, we've worked in collaboration with NOAA for the design and installation of this, and uh, we anticipate a significant amount of cost savings um, over the traditional flat plate system. Next slide. So we've shown you basically all the workflows that we plan on, um, on using to establish our um, monitoring objectives, our, um, our hypothesis-based solutions. So what, what's next at the site? Well, 
in fall of this year, we'll be installing the pit array. We are continuing to monitor um, water surface elevation and uh, we'll be installing DO loggers pretty soon. Uh, we are currently working on our Tableau profile for Steigerwald. We have some water surface elevation data available and we keep um, updating that. We have full field surveys for UAV flights planned in 2023. And all of this data will available will be available in the spring of 2024 when we present our uh, data for the first year of um, post restoration monitoring. Um, I'd like to conclude this meeting by thanking everyone who has helped us in in site design in planning of all of the field surveys. Um, as you can see, we have this is a huge collaborative effort and. Uh, I mean, obviously, because the site is is so big, we definitely need all of these funders and all of these research partners to help us with it. Um, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to myself or my colleague, Sarah, Chris Collins, who's the restoration lead, and uh, Paul Kolb, who is the ecosystem functions uh, model lead. Thank you. Thank you, Stan.